All right, I uh, want to welcome all of you to the Herbert C. Kalman Seminar on International Conflict. My name is Donna Hicks, and I'm chairing the seminar. And I'd like to point out that in addition to the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs, this uh, seminar is co-sponsored by the um, Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy, the Program on Negotiation at Harvard Law School, right here at Harvard Law School, the Neiman Foundation, um, and the Neiman Foundation for, for Journalism. And we have, uh, as you know, the topic of our seminar today is the destruction of Syria and the crisis of universal values. Professor Michael Ignatieff will be our speaker, and we're thrilled to have him address this timely and important topic. So I just would like to give you uh, briefly tell you how this uh, seminar is, uh, the format of the seminar. Professor Ignatieff will give talk for about 20, 30 minutes, or actually, if you want to go longer than that, you're, you're OK. Uh, we're happy to have you go longer than that. And then finally, the rest of the time, we'll take up with the Q&A uh, from the audience. So, And let me uh, introduce Professor Michael Ignatieff. He's the Edward R. Murrow Professor of Practice at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. He's a Canadian writer, teacher, and former politician. He holds a doctorate in history from Harvard University and has held academic posts at King's College, Cambridge, the University of Toronto, and the University of British Columbia. He served in the Parliament of Canada and was the leader of the Liberal Party of Canada. His books include The Needs of Strangers, Scar Tissue, Blood and Belonging, The Warrior's Honor, Isaiah Berlin, The Rights Revolution, Human Rights as Politics and Idolatry, The Lesser Evil, Political Ethics in the Age of Terror, and the most recent book is Fire and Ashes, Success and Failure in Politics. So um, we are just thrilled that you're here with us, Michael. Thank you, Donna. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I want to give you a little government health warning before we start. This is an unremittingly grim presentation. Um, I will do my best to find glimmers of light, but you've been warned. It's a little, uh, this is a difficult, tragic, intractable subject. Um, it's wonderful to be here to talk to you about it. I look around the room and I see uh, friends. I see some former students and current students. But I also see, if I may, Herbert Kelman himself. I'm okay. giving us a Kelman seminar, and here is the man himself, so <laughs> thank you. I want to, I don't usually use PowerPoint, but I need to use PowerPoint because I want to show you some images. Um, and I want to start with one which more than any, any image I've seen encapsulates the destruction of Syria. So if we could just start with the first item. This is Homs in Syria, photographed by a drone, a Russian drone. Homs was the city that where, in some sense, the resistance to the Assad regime began in 2011. And this is what Homs looks like in 2015.
Okay, one point about this horrifying picture is that the Syrian war, unlike other ones I can think of, has had more Facebook coverage, more social media coverage, more uploaded footage than you can possibly imagine. We would have, uh, if you compare it to Sarajevo 91, the siege of Sarajevo, nothing comparable in terms of portraying the horror and desolation of the destruction. One of the things that's interesting is that this media has had almost no effect, whatever, in creating a coalition of the outraged, a coalition of the angry, a coalition of the furious. So one of the reasons I showed you that video is to show that we've never had more capacity to look at horror in the face than we have in 2016, and we seem to have less and less capacity to do anything about it. So that's one of the reasons that I wanted to show you this. I also wanted to give you a sense of the causation of the, the Syrian war, or simply the course of it in the first instance. You can't separate the Syrian catastrophe from the Iraq catastrophe. It's not merely that we know a great deal about what's happened in Syria, we also know the deep implication of American policy in the catastrophe that followed because the destabilization of Iraq was one of the preconditions, not the only one, but one of the preconditions to the disaster in Syria. There are other, and by precondition I mean that it, the Iraq invasion helped to inflame the Sunni-Shia conflicts, which then spill over into uh, the rest of the Middle East. In addition, we have a climate change factor in the making of the war. Uh, drought conditions in Syria which make the Sunni uh, farmers in the lowlands uh, increasingly under pressure. We then have the full stone of the Arab Spring in which the West with a certain amount of light-mindedness jumps into a narrative that democratic change is going to happen to the Middle East the way it happened in Eastern Europe. And so that created a climate of kind of light-minded expectations about what was going to happen in Syria that proved tragically false. Then the intervention, the connection with Libya is important, the intervention in Libya then sent a very clear message to Assad. We're coming for you next. That then reinforced his determination to hang on at any price. Assad meets the challenge of peaceful demonstrations in Homs with a uh, with brutal repression, and then everybody piles in. It becomes a proxy war in which almost everybody you can imagine is funneling arms and weapons into this region. So if you, uh, it's a, as I hope to show you, a cautionary tale in what happens when a civil war becomes a proxy war. In terms of responsibilities, the responsibility for the catastrophe, the responsibility for that awful scene in Homs clearly begins with Assad, a corrupt sectarian regime uh, that uh, has a base of only about 15% of the population, ruling 85%. Sooner or later, there's going to be trouble. He doubles down with repression. Uh, the Russians and the Iranians then pile in to support him. Without great power support, he would not still be standing. It's crucial to his survival. And then we hardly need to go over this. The United States proclaims that he must go, then doesn't do anything to make it happen. Uh, proclaimed, lays down a red line over the uh, chemical weapons uh, and does nothing. And then everybody piles in to a war and then proceeds to lose control of their proxies. If you ask yourself why there are you know, 75 groups competing uh, to oppose Assad and no political cohesion. It's partly because you have competitive principal agents arming proxies and the political order that would confront Assad simply gets, gets dispersed. Um, so this is the catastrophe we're looking at. I don't need to dwell at length again about the public policy responsibility of the United States for this catastrophe. Um, Saddam Hussein, Saddam Hussein uh, that uh, prophet maudit 
said, you're going to open the gates of hell if you come. And the gates of hell were duly opened. Um, Libya, uh, again, an operation to overthrow a dictator that did not produce anything but a decision by the, another dictator to hold on at any price. Again, this phenomenon of principles losing control of agents in proxy wars, uh, the United States allowing red lines to be crossed, uh, public uh, declarations of red lines and regime change that were never followed up by action, um, and policies that were not undertaken. It might have been possible at a certain point to engage in air interdiction simply to protect civilians. It was never done. The purpose of air interdiction is to protect civilians, A, and B, say to the dictator, there's certain ways that you can't win. The purpose of air interdiction is to remove air superiority and then force him back to the table. That strategy was never adopted. So the American policy failure seemed to me a combination of, of sins of commission, rhetorical action unbacked up by, by, by uh, concrete uh, delivery on your promise, and then failing to take actions that might have made some difference. One, just to conclude what I'm saying in terms of what you take away from this drastic story, um, don't arm rebels. I used to think that that might be an intervention strategy that would work. One of the things you, I think you learn from the Syrian case is just how dangerous it is to arm rebels and urge your allies to arm rebels. If you're not prepared to put boots on, your ground, on the ground yourself and you choose a proxy to accomplish military goals, you quickly lose any control over uh, the, the proxy. Don't demand regime change if you can't carry it out. And one of the things that, that I think is a conclusion for the future is that air interdiction and safe havens may be the least of the bad options that you've got in protecting civilians from the horror that happened. There are risks with air interdiction, there are risks with safe havens, but it seems to me the only strategy that we've got to prevent uh, civilian harms. And it is, in, in my judgment, a shame that we didn't uh, go there. Let me then look at what we're, we're looking at. You know these figures, but it's worth, I'm afraid, pounding into you just how awful it's been. By 2016, it is the, the recent, most recent body count in Syria is that 470,000 people have died here. Um, and it's worth dwelling on that because, again, it's one of these phenomena where we see the footage every day and it's somehow not computing morally for most of the watching world. Um, 470,000 people have been killed, 4.5 million refugees, 11 million internally displaced, and a terrorist caliphate in a quarter to a third of the territory. The inflammation of Shia Sunni sectarian tensions right across the Middle East. And I want to put some emphasis on this. Mm -hmm. What this does for the future, the heritage of toxic memory. What do I mean by the heritage of toxic memory? Let me show you two images. This is the great mosque in Aleppo in more peaceful times. I'm not a religious person especially, but I know a holy place when I see one. This is a holy place, an ancient holy place that commands respect from anybody as being a place of beauty and calm, the Muslim faith at its most noble and distinguished and great. Look at it now in 2013. And then think about the toxic memories that build up in a people when heritage vital to all and to the sustenance of all is destroyed. Um, this is what I mean by toxic memory. You never forget the people who brought down that mosque tower, that famous tower. You never forget what was done to your city. It's not merely those who died that you can't forget. It's what was done to the heritage that you value most. And you think about a picture like this. I chose this picture because you could have a 
100,000 pictures of Aleppo. But think about what this boy carries around in his heart and head. On the one hand, it's a picture of the incredible and very inspiring resilience of children. He's positively leaping across the debris. But then think to yourself what he's carrying in his heart and head. His life begins, remember the Aleppo siege has been going on for three or four years. This kid might be six or seven, so most of his sentient life, he's been under bombardment. And one of the imponderables about the Syrian tragedy is what this young man will grow up to think and believe about the people who did this, about the community he grew up in, about the radical lack of existential security that he had to take for granted from the moment he was able to think and reflect. And I, it's hard not to think that he will carry toxic memory in his soul for the rest of his life. One of the things that I want to now shift from talking about the destruction of Syria and how it happened to my second theme, which is the crisis of moral values. One of the things that I may be talking about myself more than I'm talking about you, but I think in the post-89 world, we believed in a certain kind of moral narrative that tied disparate events together. It was a narrative of moral progress, although we didn't quite see it that way, but it's what it was. That there would be, as the wall came down, as the Cold War ended, there would be more human rights, more democracy, more effective role by the, that wonderful thing we call the international community. There would be less great power politics, less zero-sum competition for territory and influence. There would be more responsibility to protect. I was one of the commissioners, the international commissioners, that wrote the doctrine of responsibility to protect, in which the idea was if a state is massacring its own people or is unable to prevent massacre within its borders, other states have an obligation to come in and stop that massacre. And so that was very much the key idea through the mid to late 90s, the sense that that kind of intervention by another state would reduce the kind of horror we've seen in um, Syria. And we know, and it's a cliche, that that moral narrative is now in pieces. And part of our disarray about Syria is a sense that it's not merely a bad story, but it destroys the whole story. It destroys the narrative of moral progress that sustains those of, well, I'm in a law school after all, who believe in the development of international law, the consolidation of international law, growing respect for international humanitarian law, all of it, that narrative we're invested in has been uh, grievously breached by the reality of Syria. Let's then look in some more detail about what values have been stretched, even broken by the Syrian experience. I mean, from the very beginning, the arrest, murder, and torture of peaceful demonstrators in 2011 by, by Assad, that's where it starts. That goes without response. And then we have the descent into uh, a state making war on his, it's his own people. And so you get serial systemic violation of the laws of war. So that in 2016, you're actually opening your newspaper on a October morning, and you're discovering to your surprise that there's a little town in Syria called Madaya where they haven't eaten for six months because they're under blockade and siege and the children are eating grass. And you think, am I in 2016 or am I in 1316? Right? So that sense of rupture to a, a, a moral narrative that seems to me crucial and makes it difficult for us to recognize what the hell is happening here. Um, the laws of war now involve the use of Starvation, as a, the violations involve the use of starvation as a weapon, uh, indiscriminate bombardment of civilians. I don't even dwell on the fact that no one 
not only the regime, but the violators on the other side have faced any international legal consequences in terms of facing up to impunity. And my happy doctrine of the responsibility to protect in which those of us who believed in it put so much faith, the responsibility to protect which is classically invoked by Syria. It's a classic responsibility to protect case. No one is mentioning that doctrine at all. And then, of course, and now we want to, I want to shift to show you other areas where the crisis of values is at stake, is the whole doctrine of refugee uh, protection. That would be the place where a universal commitment made in 1952 to give shelter to any person who can demonstrate a well-founded fear of persecution. It was a universalist commitment made in 1952. It is now under enormous uh, attack and may not even survive the uh, situation in Europe. And finally, another, another universal duty that, again, you would have thought had universal traction is simply the duty of rescue. Over the weekend, 26 people drowned in the Aegean. 300 people have drowned since January crossing the Aegean. This is in Europe in the 21st century. You think we have normalized, we have normalized the failure to rescue. We've normalized the idea that the protection of our borders requires people to drown. And I'm trying to get us to be aware of the ways in which we're going downstairs into a darker and darker place without quite grasping uh, what's going on. And here's where you end up. This is the, the image that everybody in the world thinks is just, you can't look at it. I don't even now like looking at it. I don't want to put it up here. But that was the image that began to trigger an international response in 2015. A desperate father seeking to escape. He wasn't an economic migrant. What people forget about this guy's dad is that he was from one of the towns under attack from Islamic State, right? He was fleeing Kobani, right? It doesn't get more desperate than fleeing Kobani. That's why he put the kid in the boat. Right? So here we are. Then the question becomes, if we start thinking about moral duty, and I'm going to talk about the duty of rescue, and then I'm going to talk about refugees, and then I'm going to talk about uh, the European response, and then we hopefully will have lots of time for question. But just stop there. Stop with the drowning child, and then think about the universal values that apply here. One of the problems that has to be faced in relation to the duty of rescue is a moral hazard problem. If NATO, if the Greeks, if the Turks put adequate shore patrols out there, does it have the effect of incentivizing further refugee flows on the expectation will we now have a better chance of making it, right? If we're thinking about universal duty, there is a conflict, in other words, between that sense of the moral intuition that we must rescue that child against a darker thought that we're creating a moral hazard problem. How do we think about that issue? It's a practical issue for every public official in Greece, Turkey, and, and also in Italy, because they're drowning getting into Italy. I think there is a moral hazard problem. I think when we make it safer to cross, more people cross. I also think that it is morally unacceptable to have death, drown, death by drowning, as a guarantee of your border. There are all kinds of ways you can guarantee the integrity of borders, but having kids drown, in my view, shouldn't be one of them, right? So then, so then what do you do? The second way to think about this, more an economic view of this, is that borders create a market. They create a market in a scarce good. How do you, and, and once you've created a market, 
you have a responsibility to regulate it. And we shouldn't regulate it in such a way that we give uh, the traffickers uh, a $5 billion business in which they sell terrible boats, phony life jackets, and 300 people drown in the last six weeks. So we have a duty, in my view, to regulate that market. And, you know, we seem to find it unbelievably difficult to get naval patrols, to pick people out of the water, to do the simple acts of decency. The moral hazard argument has gone so far that our regulation consists in having children drown in the Aegean. So that's an issue we need to think about. If we're going to rescue universal values, we need to think about the tension between moral hazard and duty. And I'm saying, trying to give you some arguments that duty trumps. OK. Um, now, I want to switch to the, the duty we have to, to refugees. This is the problem that Angela Merkel is looking at, a surge of refugees flooding in. This is only November, but the trend keeps riding off the right of the chart. And it's one thing, this is a point here, it's one thing to think of an obligation as universal when it's this refugee, then that refugee, then another refugee. When suddenly the universal claim meets an infinite number of demanders, the universal claim automatically begins to buckle. And I want to take you through that problem. It's not simply, in other words, I'm saying it's not simply that we've, in many ways, abandoned universal values in the Syrian crisis and disgraced our supposed commitment to universal values. There's a deeper problem, which some of the universal values don't allow us to make triage in political situations. So I'm saying two things. One, we betrayed values, and even when we have to uphold them, the universal values are not, not been a good guide to what we actually have to do. Let me take you through that issue. Most of the Syrians, as you know, are not in Europe. The people who borne the real burden of the refugee crisis are in Turkey, uh, uh, Lebanon, and Jordan. The most vulnerable of these states is Lebanon, which doesn't even have a government. You've got countries like the Visegrad countries in Eastern Europe who won't take a single refugee, complaining that this will threaten their Christian values, their Christian ident identity, their Christian civilization. Give me a break. Gives Christianity a bad name. And you've got poor little Lebanon without a government taking a million, million plus. So the burden sharing here is, is so grotesquely out of whack with capacity, it makes you furious even to look at it. The other fact about the refugee exodus is that one of the reasons they're flooding into Europe is that the humanitarian obligation to fully fund World Food Program and uh, the UNHCR wasn't met. Again, there's a kind of nauseating blah, blah, blah about international solidarity and a thing called the international community. That phrase should be banned from a classroom at Harvard. The word international community has no content, no meaning, right? And this is where you see it. You have a, you, you have a, you have a, States have a commitment to fully fund UNHCR. They've sat there for four years, not funded UNHCR. They backed themselves into a situation where the World Food Program began to cut back the food rations of Syrian refugees in September 2014. What do you suppose is going to happen? Right? There's a kind of inattention to consequence, policy consequence here, which is truly alarming. The refugees are not a blind, lemming rush of irrational human beings. They are political agents who are voting with their feet. They are voting against the international refugee policies that they have to 
endure. They're voting against an international community that has done nothing to stop the war. They're acting as political agents. That's why they're coming to Europe. And they're saying, maybe you got something for me in 20 years, but I've got kids, age four, five, six, and they won't have a life unless I act. So we need to think of refugees as political actors who have an agenda, and they are voting with their feet. And they're voting with their feet partially because that's what Zatari refugee camp, the fifth largest city in Jordan, looks like in the winter. If you've got a daughter like that, you think better in Darmstadt. And so they begin coming ashore in large numbers in 2015, and they're still coming. 2,000 are coming into Germany every day. This is not over. It's going to continue through 2016. And as weather improves, there are going to be more of them crossing. And at this point, I want to stop and talk a little bit from the perspective of a refugee. Many things about Hannah Arendt you know, but one of them is that she was a refugee. She was a refugee from Nazi Germany who fled first to France and then through Portugal to the United States. And she reflected on what it was like to suddenly be stateless, to suddenly not have a country to suddenly be a refugee. And she said this very memorable thing. If a human being loses his political status, he should, according to the implication of the inborn and inalienable rights of man, come under exactly the situation for which the declaration of such general rights provided. Actually, the opposite is the case. It seems that a man who is nothing but a man has lost the very qualities which make it possible for other people to treat him as a fellow human being. I mean, if you're trying to define what this crisis of values are, this is where we get to. The expectation we've had, I think, since 1945, since the creation of the Universal Declaration, uh, the Refugee Convention, the Covenants, uh, the Geneva Conventions, the idea we had was to create uh, a rights-bearing subject who would always be able to make a claim against another state, another person, on the basis of rights. And Hannah Arendt, at the beginning of this process, was raising a question. And she was saying, the minute you lose a passport, you're on your own. And that remains, it seems to me, what we keep rediscovering in the Syrian crisis people making claims of right against other states and discovering they are a man who's nothing but a man has lost the very qualities which make it possible for other people to treat him as a fellow human being. Go to the Macedonian border right now and run that quotation in front of some of the Syrian refugees trying to get across the Macedonian border, sitting with, against a shut border, and they will understand exactly what Hannah Arendt is saying. They are rightless, stateless persons. And our fantasy was we'd create a world in which no one would be rightless. And we seem to have backed into the world that Hannah Arendt feared we might enter. And the reason we've done so is not mysterious. Rights are effective only when they're enforced. They can only be enforced by states. And here we get to the deeper problem with universality that I wanted to, to move to because it allows to, us to understand the problem that uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel has. She's accepted, and it's entrenched in the Grundgesetz of the German Constitution, a universal and unlimited obligation to take in the persecuted. Right? That's what, it, that's what she's got. A Grundgesetz, which makes a foundational commitment to dignity, Donna Hicks's operative word, and a constitutional and international legal obligation to take as many persecuted people as show up at her door with a well-founded and documented fear. And when she signed, when the German constitution, when the constitution makers in reparation for Germany's catastrophic history said, this is our way of saying we will never go back to where we were. 
they never imagined that this is where it would lead them, to a situation where they have a universal commitment that they actually, as a practical matter, don't feel they can meet. And the problem they've got is when liberal progressives, and I'm a liberal progressive, say to Germany, well, a million's not a lot of people, right? You've heard that demographic argument. You can take lots more because you've got plenty of room. It's missing the basic problem, which is democratic consent. It's not a numbers game, ultimately. It's a matter of maintaining democratic consent. So you have these you have two forces, an irresistible force of moral expectation. That's what that picture is. Angie is going to save us. Angie understands us. Angie will give us a home up against a German public that understands this about politics, which is that you can't maintain democratic consent for refugee integration and resettlement, unless you can tell the German public you have control of your borders. If you can't maintain control of your borders, if you feel you've lost control of your borders, then you've got a situation where a universal commitment comes into direct conflict with the principle of democratic consent. And democratic consent is draining out of this process day by day and week by week and politicians who can't control their borders lose their office. So, what are they trying to do about this? I'm running a little long. I'll try and get through so we have plenty of time for questions. Already, a triage mechanism is in place, and that's what you're looking at. The yellow indicates those who are granted refugee status. Syrian refugees are being given refugee status in 87% of the cases but Albanian migrants are getting turned down 98% of the time. Eritreans are getting in close to 70% of the time. Iraqis are getting refugee status most of the time. Nigerians and Pakistanis, no. So the triage system is working. That's a triage system essentially between a refugee and a migrant. Okay, that's how you try and keep control of your, of your borders. And each country is doing it slightly differently. Germany is much more generous in granting uh, asylum uh, refugee determinations than Italy next door, France next door, Sweden, the UK, and the Netherlands. So each country is engaged in discretionary judgment here. Universality is basically ceding to the, the sovereignty principle. And here's where the problem comes in terms of border control. This is an important graph. This indicates those who've been refused entry. This indicates, the blue indicates those who've been apprehended. But the point is, this also indicates those who've been returned to a third country. The bottom line, the, the, the crimson line at the bottom is those who've actually been returned. So what you're looking at here is a system in which there is a huge and growing gap between those who are caught for immigration violations as, as, as migrants and those who are being returned. The system is not returning those who are in violation of the migration regulations. And that means that there, are, there is a continual and growing challenge to the legitimacy of the migration system in Europe. And this is exploding consent not just for migration, but also for refugees, right? This gap between who are you catching as being a violator and those who are returning, basically nobody's going home. And so this is the, the, the political dynamic of uh, the European refugee crisis that we need to keep in mind. The other, the other element of this dynamic is integration. You'll all remember the seen in uh, Cologne uh, Station on New Year's Eve. That was where this, uh, the crisis of integration occurred. And one way to think about integration, the integration of migrants and refugees, is that it is a process of mutual recognition. A process of mutual recognition. 
we say yes to you on condition you say yes to us. And the political doubt in Germany is whether they are saying yes to us. And then the question becomes, what should the yes consist of? Yes, the yes we say to you is a job, a home, and a path to citizenship. The yes that you must say to us is respect for the rule of law, and any criminal conduct abrogates the, the contract. And I focus on the rule of law here because the, the dispute about what happened in the Cologne railway station has become a conflict between Muslim values and Western values. Give me a break. It's not a conflict between any of those things. It's about the rule of law and law and order. It's a policing issue. If you break the law, you've broken the essential contract. I don't think a liberal society can ask for complete ethical conformity from Minorities of any kind, but they can, a liberal society can ask for obedience to the law. Simple, not complicated. Uh, and we've inflated the integration debate into a debate about a culture class between competing civilizations. It's much simpler than that. It's about the rule of law and law and order. Now, so that's why this... The universal values are not simply under crisis because the, the Western governments have let the Syrian crisis get out of control. It's not simply because they failed to fully fund the refugee uh, agencies that are trying to stabilize the populations in the frontline states. It's also, and this is the more discomforting aspect of this story, because there's a conflict between state sovereignty and universal obligation that becomes impossible for a politician to bridge like Merkel at the moment in which the demanders of asylum, those with a well-founded fear of persecution, simply overwhelm the system. So she's got to get that under control. But let's just, I really am coming to the end of this talk. I want to take you still further to one still gloomier possibility. This could get worse. What if the peace talks break down and the war restarts? What if Aleppo falls? What if Assad wins? Then it seems to me very quickly, Germany will have to close its borders. It will close its borders because uh, Turkey will close its borders. When Turkey closes its borders, Jordan will close its borders. The only remaining place to go will be into Lebanon, and Lebanon may simply be unable to uh, deal with the problem. Syrians will then be trapped inside Syria with a regime bent on vengeance against those who rebelled against it. So the humanitarian dimensions of that need to be clearly understood. The idea that we're going to inch our way away from this scenario we need to look at this scenario because it seems to me to be quite likely, quite likely, uh, and a source of concern. And it seems to me one of the people who will gain here will be Islamic State. If you've been abandoned by the West and you're a Sunni, if your attempt to flee to a better life has been stopped, if all of your alternatives have been shut down, Raqqa looks pretty good to you, right? So the strategic cost that the West may pay for this may be the dramatic strengthening of a terrorist state. And finally, there is a way out of this. But it, the minute you put it on a piece of paper, as I've done here, you begin to see how difficult it is to avoid the worst, how fervently we should wish that we can avoid the worst, but how worried we should be. You get three antagonists pressing the parties to consolidate a ceasefire into something more enduring. And you turn the, the conflict into a political battle mostly conducted in negotiation. At first it goes nowhere, but any form of negotiation is better than the slaughter that's going on. Turkey and Germany make a grand bargain in which Turkey agrees to accept refugees repatriated from Greece 
In return, they get visa access to Europe. In return, the West commits a coalition of the willing, US, Canada, Germany, Australia, and maybe another European state commit to take refugees directly from the refugee camps in the frontline states. You process directly and you airship them out. It is the only way to stop people drowning, right? This will do something to undercut that market in death. You then fully fund the refugee camps. Instead of 50% funding, you fund them 100%. Uh, you then persuade the frontline states, and it's extremely difficult for Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon to do this, to allow uh, refugees and to work uh, move out of the camps, begin to integrate into the, into the economy. And you help the frontline states to, to integrate them. And then you try, through negotiation, to get a political transition that may take a very long time, and you have to give guarantees to the Alawites. You have to, and in 10 years' time, someone might come back and live in homes. And then you have to have an international consortium to rebuild Syria. And what I haven't put on the board is the toughest swallow of all, which is the Alawite regime survives. Hopefully not Assad, but the Alawite regime survives. And notice what I've just done. I've made a peace in, instead of justice. In the peace-justice trade-off, I've, I've just chose peace above justice. And that may make some of you indignant, but that, it seems to me, ultimately here in getting this thing to end, we may all have to look at. And that choice is easy for us to make and incredibly bitter and difficult for those who courageously resisted the Assad regime. And finally, and here's my last slide, you'll be relieved and I hope we get to questions. Sometime in the future, remember that kid skipping through the ruins in Aleppo? What you pray for is that he'll go back to that. That's not a picture of Aleppo in the future. That's a picture of Aleppo in 2007, before the war started. A surpassingly beautiful city that figures in Shakespeare, that figures in our literature, that's part of the, our, our, our experience of, of Western civilization, a place that St. Paul visited. It's just part of us, Aleppo. And all we can do is pray that one day Aleppo will get back to that. Thanks for your attention. Well, thank you, Michael. That was a, that was a brilliant analysis. And even though it was sobering, I think um, you really painted a clear picture for us and, and drew some lines of action. So I appreciate it very much. Now we're going to turn to you, the audience, um, and if you'd like to make a comment, just indicate to me, and then we'll take them one by one. Yes, and you please identify yourself. Uh, Eric Cullen, I'm with a group called Act of Sudan, and uh, like, well, I know you've written a lot in Sudan. It actually surprised me when you talk about Sudan in your talk, because the crisis of values, and every one of the failures and interventions you articulated didn't start in 2011. It's serious to practice them for the prior eight years, all the failures of the international community. And we know that Assad learned from Russia. If the international community, the United States, the European Union, etc., didn't learn, and we did the same strategies, then we got, in what practice, similar and awful results. I think that's an important comment. Um, I had to start my tale of woe somewhere. And you're saying you started the clock too late. Uh, the appeasement of Bashir of Sudan in respect of Darfur, uh, in respect of um, ethnic cleansing, forced displacement, and massacre. Um, uh, we have a lot of difficulty understanding that uh, dictators learn from each other. Uh, if we allow impunity in one case, we allow people to get away with it, they, they learn. They quickly learn. And <clears throat> I think there's no, I, I, I have nothing to add to what you said other than to confirm it. Um, we, we have uh, 
And I guess what I'm trying to get us to focus on is the extraordinary dis disproportion between our rhetoric and our action uh, and the ways in which our rhetoric is, as, has actually become damaging because we make claims about stopping genocide in Darfur. Then we call it genocide. We use the, the word. Then we don't correlate that with any effective action. And people measure the difference the distance between words and action very quickly. And it's just a consequence. And I, I, I do want to, I mean, I, I also want to make it clear, I don't, I'm not one of those, if I ever was, who believes that the United States has a solution to every problem, that there is a solution to many problems. There are a lot of situations which we can't and shouldn't fix. But the one thing we can do is shut up if we can't do something. But there's the it's the disproportion between rhetorical claims and action that is actually causing the United States and other countries, including my own country, Canada, strategic harm. Um, Michael, before you answer the question, could you just do a very quick summary because we are taping it? And oh, I can summarize the questions. I'd be happy okay, to. So happy. this gentleman here is next. So, Michael, do you have any uh, statistics or metrics um, in terms of? Uh, refugees leaving their country and returning in terms of both uh, timeline and percentage of people who actually return. Correct, return to a place like Syria? In, in any, any, any previous situation, I've told the Syrian situation is resolved, but in previous one, there was Somalia, Rwanda, Uganda, Well, Let's just start with the Syrians. All the Syrians who flooded into Germany, for example, when you interview them, they say, I don't want to be here. I want to be back home. They all want to go back home. And then you ask them, will you go home as long as Assad is there? And they all say, can't go home if Assad is there. And that's an important political fact. Any political settlement here that leaves that regime or leaves him in place uh, will drastically reduce the amount of refugee return, at least in the short term. Almost everybody who, I am the grandson of refugees, by the way, so this is personal. Uh, we all want to go back, and we very rarely do. Either because we can't, because situation just too adverse, or because a better life begins to open up. Um, but, um, I think it varies from place to place. Um, and some refugee populations, and we can think of the Palestinian refugee population, there's a population passionately determined to go back and can't go back and is unlikely to be able to go back. That's a population for, for the political reasons too obvious to state. Somalis, huge Somali populations in Kenya, uh, unlikely to go back. Lots of Sudanese, unlikely to go back. So the, the refugee situation is a tragic one in which you hang the, hang the, the rusty uh, key to the door of your house around your neck and you wear it to the end of your life, but you never get to put it back in the door is what I think generally happens. Sir. My name is Donald Spade. I'm a car engineer and uh, associate with Harvard. A uh, question is off and on that we talks in the Western media about partition in the country from Syria. And those who raised this question probably forgot the partition of Palestine and partition of some other countries in the, the area. The question is, has the U.S. been talked about countries west of Iraq all the way to the Mediterranean Sea? They all have one thing in common. Islam is a religion. And they all speak Arabic. Is there any talk anywhere in the world about putting a united or union of Arabic speaking people in this whole geographical area? Well, yeah. Um, the, the question is uh, I'm going to redo the question. And given that state order in the Middle East is collapsing, and given that they're all Arabs and they all speak Arabic, 
has anybody ever thought of putting them all together in a, in a, in a, in a u unit? Is there some pan-Arab solution here? And, you know, Nasser tried that in the 50s with uh, the union between Egypt and, and Syria. It didn't last very long. Um, it turns out that the states created mostly by, you know, the Western empires have proved quite enduring, and they've proved quite enduring because each of these places develops their own political culture and it gets difficult to move it around. So there's pan-Arab feeling that doesn't seem to translate into any common uh, future. Uh, and we are looking at a world in which uh, you all remember that uh, image of Islamic State uh, tanks uh, smashing up the berm that separates Syria and Iraq, uh, simply deliberate conscious attempt to erase that border, to say that these two states no longer exist as far as Islamic State is concerned, because they're sitting right across the border. I don't think they'll succeed, and I think eventually um, we are looking at the very slow emergence of another state order there. I mean, look at what we're going to get pretty soon. Um, we may get, we have a de facto independent Kurdistan in northern Iraq. We have a de facto independent Shia uh, world south of Baghdad down to, to Basra, in effect, increasingly closely linked to Iran. Uh, we have uh, the phenomenon of Latakia and the Alawite regions along the coast, which are one part of Syria. We have the Islamic State in the middle. We have the fragmentation of an order, and we have no idea how this is going to eventually uh, emerge into a future order. But it's not going to be a pan-Arabic order. That seems to me to be pretty sure. Sir. I'm, I'm very interested to see um, the recent political success in Canada of having a uh, settlement of 25,000 refugees. Is, is there a way to capitalize on that? Is there a sense of how many refugees could successfully be politically settled in, in a country like Canada and where you take it from, from this first step? It's a question about whether the fact that the new Canadian government has settled 25,000 refugees in Syria. What kind of example is that to other, other countries? Um, and how far can you go in Canada? Yeah. And how far, how much more could Canada do? The uh, Liberal government is committed to 40,000 refugees uh, this year. Uh, they have taken 25,000 between the 4th of December and late February. Uh, the projected cost of this through the cycle, that is, through their full repatriation over the next four or five years, is 600 million Canadian dollars, so it's not cheap. But the Canadian public is uh, strongly in favor. And this illustrates, I think, a hugely important point, which is that refugee integration becomes a definitional moment for every society. And because the Liberal government framed it this way, Canadians looked at, it was as if they looked in the mirror and said, that's us. That's us. That's the kind of country we want to be. We want to be a country that says yes to refugees. And so it's been politically very successful, I think morally very successful, and a good thing. Let's, I've talked to those who've run this program, let's not get starry-eyed. Shortages of housing, shortage of jobs, difficulties of integration. I mean, some of these Syrians are coming literally out of the fields of small agricultural holdings in the middle of, you know, the Middle East, and they're in Oshawa, right? I mean, it's a big change. So let's not get ahead of ourselves. It's going to be a decade before we know just whether this has worked. But the policy point I would make is that if you compare that to the United States, the United States since 2011 has taken less than 3,000 Syrian refugees. Let's, let's be fair, let's get it in context. The United States takes 65,000 refugees from around the world. But its Syrian quotient is tiny. Its Syrian quotient is the number of Syrians coming into Germany every day. And the, United, and the president has said, I'll take 15,000. And he's facing intransigent Republican opposition, and opposition from 37 governors. And 
He's got eight, nine months to run. This is a leadership opportunity to, to stay. I want to take more refugees, and here's how we're going to do it. We're going to repatriate them directly from Turkey. We're going to take them to Fort Dix or some military establishment to take this security issue off the table. We're going to vet them clearly, and then we're going to integrate them in, into American communities. This is who we are. You make it a definitional statement of American identity and American generosity. Can he do it in an election year? Can he do it in a situation where he's very worried that this will give the Republicans uh, um, a weapon against uh, Mrs. Clinton? These are the kind of issues that the president is dealing with. But from a strategic point of view, I just think it would make send a very important message to Europe at the moment. That is, we're with you. We believe in refugee integration and resettlement. We're with you, Turkey. We want to help you, too. So refugee resettlement is both definitional of your identity as a country, but it is also strategically extremely important. Canada has now listened on these issues, frankly. Let's not neglect the power dimensions of this. It's once you play in and make a big commitment like that, you get listened to. The United States will be listened to on these issues if it does two things, if it takes uh, a number substantially higher than 15,000, resettles them successfully this year, and also simply commits, and this the president can do, to take this funding issue off the table. Let me just simply say it is ridiculous. We've got three strategic allies of the United States, Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon, that are barely able to, to stand up under the pressure of this human wave. We, the United States, will rally the international community to stump up. And rally the international community to stump up means getting China to pay its dues. It means getting Russia to pay its dues. It means getting, you know, Saudi Arabia to pay its dues. I mean, I'm steamed about this because it just, it's grotesque that uh, the needs of these communities have been underfunded. And the United States, those are leadership opportunities that they could seize. And I hope that when Mr. Trudeau sees Mr. Obama on Friday in Washington, which he's going to do, he says all this, because that's the point. He's now got the credibility to say it. He can, go into the, he can go into the Oval Office and bang the table. I've stumped up, Mr. President. What about you? I know we're a little country, but that's how you do it, right? So. Yeah, I'm curious you I As far as I remember, when people were talking about sort of the aerial, you know, no fly, there were a lot of progressive liberals who sort of greatly lacked all the American intervention. And, yeah. and I'm curious if you could just comment sort of on the role of that intellectual group, the role that they played, and what you think of that kind of sort of The question is whether. Uh, what has been the progressive liberal approach to uh, no-fly zones and air interdiction and, and, and other issues? Has the liberal progressive position been helpful on these issues? Um, I do think that on the air interdiction and air uh, safe havens issue, uh, the liberal progressives, and I count myself as one, I've often fought the last war. Uh, and because it will be done by the United States, then it the farther left you go in the spectrum, the more hostile you are to the use of you know, um, air interdiction from uh, assets in the Mediterranean or in the, or in the, um, in the Gulf. Um, the more hostile you are to, the more suspicious you are of the motives. Uh, my point about air interdiction is you've got to put two things together, force and diplomacy. You use air interdiction to protect a population because you simply say you can't use aerial bombardment, barrel bombs, for example, to win this war. The minute you do that, you've made a strategic intervention in the war. You've said you can't win this way. Once you do that to Assad, you remove his air superiority, you dramatically increase the likelihood that he will negotiate a solution. I mean, there are no guarantees here, and he has proven how ruthless he is. But unless you do something like that, to change his political calculus, uh, you've got no chance of negotiating uh, 
a ceasefire and a, uh, some form of political transition. He has to know he can't win this way before anything can happen. As long as he thinks he can win, all bets are off, and he will, I think, uh, take on Aleppo. The other piece of this, to follow the progressive liberal line, is some of what I just said to you is deeply controversial among liberal progressives, particularly all my stuff about maintaining consent. And everything I've been saying also about repatriating refugees directly from Turkey. There are many people who say, well, that violates the universal obligation to admit asylum claims. It means you're going to pick and choose 250,000, 300,000 Turks or people in uh, refugees in Turkish or Jordanian or Lebanese camps. That violates your universal obligation. I'm saying yes. That's exactly what I'm saying. Because I don't see how an un... I don't see what's been going on in 2015 as sustainable through 2016. Something else has to happen. She has to put a cap on what she can take. She's the last European country actually taking refugees. So the liberal progressives who think, well, she should just keep taking 2,000 a day for the end of time, don't understand the political dynamics, and they don't understand the principle, which is she has to maintain democratic consent. You can't take a position which says, my commitment to these universal values trumps what, what my, the people who elected me think indefinitely. You can lead, and she has led, and I enormously admire the way she's led, but there's a limit to what you can do. So there's a place where, if you look at Human Rights Watch, you go to their website, they're very critical of the idea that you should essentially limit the flow in any way. Basically, all the refugees in Turkey should be settled in Europe because Europe's richer and more able to cope than Turkey. It's just not a practical political solution to the problem. It just isn't. Um, so, so we've got value conflicts. We've got real issues we have to talk about honestly. And I'm laying out my stall, and I may be wrong about all kinds of things here, but that's what I'm trying to, trying to frame the debate. Yeah. Um, taking aerial, uh, aerial integration further and considering that responsibility to protect allows for military intervention for humanitarian purposes, why is that, or can you describe why that's not part of your solution slide today? The aerial interdiction? Uh, why is military intervention an aerial interdiction? Well, I urge, I have, not that anybody's actually hanging on every word I say, but for the record, I have urged no-fly and aerial interdiction for, since 2012, effectively, in public. Um, uh, I think, and as late as 10 days ago, I did a piece in the Washington Post and in the Financial Times saying we need, we need to stop the bombardment and encirclement and starvation of Aleppo. And we need to do so again with this linkage to diplomacy. This is the only way to get Vienna, Geneva, whatever that process is called, started again. So it's, it's still part of my, what I'm hoping, I've taken it off this slide simply because we've got a ceasefire and I wanted to maintain. If the ceasefire breaks down, it seems to me we're back into that situation. Because then the, Well, but military intervention by whom is the issue? And again, as a political matter, no president is going to author authorize, as, as they call it, boots on the ground or even proxies on the ground. And one of the, the, again, controversial conclusions I'm drawing from this is arming proxies has been, a, has been a disaster. A, we haven't been able to find anybody reliable. The stuff's gone to the bad guys. We have no control over them. And by control, I mean we have no control over their human rights violations. Let's not assume from these slides that the only guilty party in this story is Assad. There have been grotesque violations on the other side. The preponderance of the human rights abuses are clearly on the side of the government, but it's clearly being happened by some of the people that we're supporting. And that should be properly a moral embarrassment to the United States and those states that are supporting them. So, sir? Now, you mentioned that Saudi Arabia, China, Russia need to sort of step up and do their part. It strikes me that the tragedy of the comms issue, and if you look at Canada, it took in 25,000, it's going to cost 600 million. It's not solved in crisis. Yeah. How does this progress? How does it turn from the odd country to an outlier in terms of 
forward the load to other countries stepping up. How does this turn from a tragedy of the commons into an act of international solidarity? Um, my last slide tried to put together all the pieces that have to come right precisely to say, I'm not sure how it can. Uh, a ceasefire that endures, a ceasefire in which essentially Putin is saying to Assad, I think what he, I hope he's saying is, do you realize what it's going to cost you to take Aleppo? Do you understand what it takes to crush a city with 300,000 people and, and all the fighters in the region have flooded into the city? This is block by block, street by street, and I, Vladimir Putin, are telling you, we did Grozny and it was very costly, so I'm hoping that's what Putin is saying to Assad, which is why he stopped. I have no guarantee he's saying that, and if that goes down, then we're into scenarios that may involve, I think, air interdiction, sim simply to, 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 to change the, the military dynamic and, and, and get the negotiations back on track. How we get the Chinese and everybody to, to, to play, I don't know. The difficulty that the United States has is if it goes at the United Nations, for example, and bangs the cup and goes around to the P5 and all the member states and says, you've got to do something about the refugees, the easy mark is you took 2,000. What are you, you're in a no position to lecture. So I'm saying, let's think strategically here. A gesture that says we're going to take quite a lot of refugees changes the political dynamic in which you could begin to leverage other countries to take part. And with China, hell, you say, look, OK, you wanted to be a global power, right? This is what being a global power means. It doesn't mean simply arranging highly profitable deals with Zambia and every other African state. It also means funding the commons. You want to fund the commons? That's the price of being a leader. Uh, the United States have, has to have the credibility to make those claims. I, I see nothing in the American approach to this problem that's putting it all together. Uh, air interdiction, political leverage to force a solution, uh, full funding for the uh, frontline states, and crucially, political assistance to Europe, to Merkel, to get the Turks to sign on the line. I mean, Joe Biden should be in Ankara right now saying, come on. This is a threat, you know, when they say that, when the head of NATO is saying that Putin is weaponizing immigrant refugees, what he's getting at is the deeply destabilizing effect of refugee flows on the political cohesion of Europe. This is a security threat to the security architecture created by the United States from 1948 onwards. And it's like, when I say this, there, there's some deep dissociation in Washington about this issue. They don't see the refugee crisis as a strategic crisis that's threatening the cohesion of its primary alliance. But that's what needs to be understood if you're going to get a strategic response to this uh, crisis. Sir? Why not? Why don't you see that? Why? I, I'm, look. It's the kind of thing you say at Harvard, and I'm sure in the Beltway, there's all kinds of people saying, don't give me lectures. We understand perfectly what the strategic you know, stakes are. Uh, we just can't get the president to move. I think there's some pivot to Asia stuff going on here. I think in a weird way, there's some sense that the, the president personally gets Asia in ways that he doesn't get Europe. That's a bit too anecdotal, but I, I think there's an issue there. Um, I think there is a uh, there is also a sense of futility in U.S. policy, a sense that we can't take enough refugees to make a difference, so let's not even try because it's a tough lift and it's an election year, so that goes off the table. Uh, there is also another feature of kind of we gave at the office already. The United States is already the biggest supplier of humanitarian assistance to the frontline states. So when you go to Washington, they say, hey, we've already made massive commitments, right? You know, and the, the Chinese are stiffing us. What do you want me to do, right? And what they're getting at is what you don't understand about our world, they say to me, Mr. Ignatieff, is 
American power is not what it once was, and its capacity to compel action or incentivize action among its allies and partners is not what it was in the 1990s. 2016, we're in a new world. That's, I think, what they're really saying. They're saying we don't have the power. I don't think they're right, but that's what I'm getting back. Sir? Um, I'm a visiting scholar in the Harvard Engineering of Sociologists in South Korea. And we, we introduced um, each other in the email, and I remember who I am. And uh, since uh, the discussion really revolves around like, you know, you know, what can be done to accelerate uh, initiating and initiate accelerate uh, burden sharing, um, I'm just wondering what can be done um, to like, you know, uh, make other countries we haven't mentioned about uh, take part in the global effort to share uh, burden. There are many countries that have been uh, left out from the discussion, like uh, Latin America is one of them, and Asia has been largely uh, neglected, except China you briefly mentioned about. And then even there are some African countries that are doing fairly well, like Kenya, like, uh, like uh, South Africa. Even though South Africa has accepted a lot of refugees from the, uh, the neighboring countries in crisis, so I'm just wondering uh, what are the ways in which um, in those countries uh, the issue of burden sharing can be discussed and uh, get recognized and uh, lead to the plausible political solutions to accept more refugees. And then I'm just wondering uh, what would be the role of the United Nations to put those actors together and move things forward. So that's a question about burden sharing and why the burden sharing hasn't spread to Africa and Asia and, and Latin America. Um, and those are good points. Uh, you, know, we, you know, such as our provincialism here in North America, we forget that you know, Brazil and Argentina are immigration societies, deeply immigration societies, and they have a pretty good record of integration. Uh, and the Latin Americans have taken some some, uh, some folks, and they can take more. On the Asian side, I mean, you know, we saw what Asian solidarity looked like when we looked at the Rohingya refugees afloat in the Andaman Sea off Malaysia. You'd think the, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, the, the, Muslim, the, the, the fraternity of Muslim countries would lead to religious solidarity uh, in Indonesia and Malaysia and other most of the majority countries in Asia to take in their refugees, it hasn't happened. They're the ones who are turning the boats around. Uh, and so that's, uh, I think that the issue you're raising is that, you know, migration is now a global phenomenon. You ticked off South Africa. You know, I, we were in South Africa in December. Huge refugee flows from collapsing Zimbabwe, from, from Zambia, from Mozambique. Um, and almost everywhere, the reaction is shredding universal obligation. I mean, almost everywhere, um, you're getting countries saying, um, we're tired of being leached upon, we're tired of being ripped off, we're tired of having our borders uh, broached, uh, they're depressing wages. There's a, there's a huge amount of that going on. And that's why, you know, um, the president is supposed to have commissioned a kind of refugee and migration summit at the next UN General Assembly in September. This gets to your last point. I think it would be very important for everybody to start talking about this. We have 60 million people on the move in the world at any moment, Migra migrants and refugees. And we simply have no international regimes that are holding together in the face of this pressure. Um, and what we're going back to is the sovereigntist response in every case, which is um, setting, setting, uh, setting triage limits at the lowest possible threshold. Um, and I think in the long term, that's, that's unsustainable. I mean, if you think long term here, um, uh, we need an international migration regime. Uh, let me tell you a little story about that. Uh, we think this is beyond the reach of our imaginations, but if you go back to 1923, and you, does anybody know what a Nansen passport is? There we are. Fridtjof Nansen, famous Norwegian explorer, 
mandated by the League of Nations to provide refuge for the two million plus Russian refugees who crossed the Russian border after the Bolshevik Revolution. Think of that, two million people flooded into Europe in the space of about a year and a half to Berlin and Paris, just overwhelmed the borders, fleeing the, the Russian Revolution. Fridtjof Nansen said, what we have to do is give these people papers. He was the League of Nations mandate to, guy mandated to deal with this problem, and he came up with a Nansen passport. Gave everybody a photograph, gave everybody an ID, which allowed them to travel, allowed, prevented them being shut up in internment camps and refugee camps, prevented them from being bullied by national governments. They had the right to move. He, they produced millions of these things. They produced papers for migrants. I care about this because my grandparents traveled on Nansen passports for a decade. And, and it gets back to the Hannah Arendt slide. They felt they had papers. They felt they had rights. They felt when they went to a border, they weren't kind of humble supplicants of a arbitrary sovereign power. They felt they could, you know, I got my, I got my papers. So we need to think in the 21st century of a Nansen passport for the 21st century so that migration becomes a standard normal. So that you come into France for two years from Mali or from the Sub-Sahara, you, you have a nice little biometric identifier with your face and your iris and the whole thing so it can't be fakes. You got a date in, you got a date out, and provided you got that paper, you can't be bullied, you can't be fired, you can't be pushed around, you can't be abused, you have protections that go with that and you have certain entitlements to welfare, right? an internationally mandated migration regime based on that kind of biometric identifier would take us a long way forward. And we need to get there. And it's, states can do that. Uh, because otherwise the alternative is, you know, the jungle in Calais and, you know, illegal migration. And don't forget the illegal, the, the, you know, this country, the United States, has more illegal undocumented migrants than any other country in the world. And, and this is not good for this country. You want to have legalized migration regimes that take migration out of the power of the traffickers, give migrants the right to come, and then you have to have repatriation regimes when they violate the terms and go back. And that begins to give you something that looks like a humane international migration regime for a global age. But it means everybody's got to step up and think about this. So, sir? Yes, uh, my name is Yad I'm a Sloan Fellow at, at uh, MIT. Um, my question is, have you normalized the refugee figures for countries that are not uh, <coughs> parties to the uh, UN protocol for refugees, uh, such as the Gulf states or the yeah. refugees? So Saudi Arabia uh, alone has uh, States that uh, it has taken two and a half million refugees, <coughs> but uh, because of the technicality, they're not party to the, the yeah. protocols. Those numbers are often not accounted. Yes, there's a the um, the Gulf states and, and Saudi and the other Gulf states are much criticized for not doing their part, and they say we're doing lots. We just don't call them refugees. They settle in our country, and we try and help them and. There are brothers and blah, blah, there are sisters and they stay with us. Um, but if you look at, with the exception of Kuwait, if you look at the actual dollar contribution to international relief efforts from those Gulf states, it's incredibly low. Kuwait has stumped up 100 million, but the rest of them are, have got the means to do much more. I know the Gulf, the oil price is falling, everybody's in a tight spot, but the criticism you would make is that they have undersubscribed their contributions to the international agencies that are helping the frontline states. And just, you know, 10 days ago, Saudi pulled a plug on Lebanon for reasons relating to its conflict with Iran. So you're looking at a country uniquely vulnerable to, to the recrudescence of civil war, where the Saudis have just pulled $4 billion out of the national treasury, which was going to maintain the, the army in, in 
Lebanon, which is one of the few national institutions that maintains any kind of cohesion. Well, we're looking, I, in one of my what if slides, I was looking at the, the re-eruption of a civil war in Lebanon. And that seems to me one of, the, one of the many consequences that may happen if we don't get this right. I've got time for one more question, sir. You talked at the beginning about the way actors uh, in the Syrian conflict have undermined universal values. But have you seen the opposite uh, at all, where actors have gone about promoting or acting in ways that wind up promoting international norms and universal values? I'm thinking specifically of the agreement to remove Assad's chemical weapons and UN security councils, a uh, resolution to allow cross border aid for the Greeks. Uh, the question is, has, any, has anybody upheld universal values since the beginning of the war? And uh, the best example, possibly the only example we've got, has been that they've taken chemical weapons off. Or have they? Uh, open question. There is some evidence that chemical weapons have been used, and I don't, I don't assume it's proven that it's always Assad. It may be other folks. This is a, a war unique in savagery. So... With the exception of that deal, which was uh, successful, uh, and I think was enforced simply because the Russians and the Americans, whatever they disagree about, thought we simply can't control the consequences if these weapons get loose. So let's take that out of the equation. But every other form of inhuman savagery known to man has been industriously practiced. Again, the preponderant of moral responsibility lies with the state party and the regime, but a lot of the people that we've funneled weapons to haven't been angels either. And uh, uh, <clears throat> on the 28th or 29th of March, the person who can best answer this question will be in the Harvard community. The head of the International Committee of the Red Cross, Peter Maurer, will be at the Kennedy School. And that's a question you should ask him. Um, and again, I, you know, to get back to my point about moral narrative, I mean, if you're running that organization and it's taking you three weeks to get to Medea and 40 checkpoints to get to Medea and um, you're having humanitarian aid stolen and re-trafficked, humanitarian aid denied to enemies, blockade situations with civilians on both sides, chiefly on the Assad side, but both, you must be asking yourself what's left of the Geneva Conventions. Um, and I, I just think this is something we have to look squarely in the face. Uh, the, there's absolutely nothing wrong with these principles, but the principle, the idea, the normative ideal that we can fight according to rules is in terrible trouble. Um, and so the moral narrative that we've made progress since 49 seems to me just simply spare me Spare me that. Let's, let's try and make things better, but don't give me narratives of moral progress because it's just there's no empirical evidence. Because it's not as if this is the first time we've ever seen it. Anybody with memories of the Bosnian War knows how inhumanly savage it was. Um, there's no new trick of horror that wasn't anticipated in the Bosnian case that hasn't been tried here. Um, this, is, this is where we are. Um, I've come to the end on that happy, cheerful note. Uh, I, 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 I want to thank you for listening and for, you, uh, for this discussion.